Um, and ladies and gentlemen, there you are, Caroline and Caroline and Andrew both sitting side by side, who lead child protection in Newcastle. And um, um, are going to talk to us about what's happened during this pandemic and um, give us some insight into what could have been done and what might be done for the future. Bless you, off you go. Okay, so um, thanks, Camille. That's a very nice introduction. Um, and um, yes, I'm here with um, Dr. Grayson, um, who's our designated doctor for children's safeguarding in Newcastle. Um, and I'm Andrew Villis, uh, for those who I've not met before. I'm the named doctor for children's safeguarding at the RVI. Um, and um, Carol and I have both uh, Develop this presentation just to talk through some of the um, the impact that COVID nineteen has had on um, our children, and young people, um, and also then thinking um, in particular about some of those safeguarding aspects as well. So, um, I mean, we're happy to take questions um, as we go or um, at the end, whichever works best. Um, but um, I don't know if Zoom has the, um, the facility for raising your hand and things. Um, but if people do want to, then that's fine. Um, so I'll. Press on if it lets me move on. Um, Andrew, so even just, just to, um, Andrew, just to say, we have a chat box, so people will direct questions for you in the chat box, and I will bring them to you, or you might be able to see the chat box yourself. Ah, that's okay. great. That's fine. Thank okay. you, Camille. Um, so. So um, even just um, up until recently, so 1st of December, this article was on the um, BBC website, still highlighting the concerns that um, that vulnerable children have been um, have been missed during um, during the COVID lockdowns, um, and stating that the um, the invisibility of uh, vulnerable children through the pandemic should be a matter of national concern. And that comes from the um, from the chief inspector of schools in England, um, and that kind of highlights that all throughout the lockdown um, periods and the pandemic in general, um, there's been a, a lot of worry about um, the impact of COVID on children um, and their overall development and needs, not just from a safeguarding issue, um, but um, their overall development and needs as well as those children who are going to be more vulnerable. Um, and so we wanted to talk to you about um, some of that and about what we've seen here locally, um, as well as some of the national findings as well. Um, and then, as I say, um, it may spark some uh, discussion and debate towards the end. Um, so right at the, um, at the beginning, um, Peter Green highlighted um, in a paper talking about the risks to children, young people during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and said that um, even at that early stage that a shift in focus was needed to avoid an irreversible scarring of a generation and talked about this um, secondary pandemic of um, child neglect and abuse for these children who were going to be missed um, as a result of the lockdown measures um, and felt that um, children and uh, were being uh, were perversely um, suffering for the benefits of adults um, as we all know, um, certainly in that first wave, the um, the view was that children were relatively unaffected by um, COVID um, and they wouldn't have the same um, medical complications as adults would. And so it was felt that a lot of the uh, measures which were being put in place were very much to safeguard the health of adults, um, but to the detriment of young children. Um, and as we can all remember um, vividly, I'm sure the stay home message um, was uh, was um, for, for everybody. Um, and um, this led to this um, reduction in children being seen by a lot of those services that would normally have had eyes on them. So children not being um, brought to the emergency department um, as frequently, um, also not necessarily being seen by the GPs as, as regularly, which was understandable that would happen. Um, and at the same time as well, it was reported in, uh, as I remember seeing the um, article on BBC News as well about um, the fact that um, alcohol sales in supermarkets was on the rise. And um, and um, Peter Green um, said that this sort of set up the perfect conditions for a safeguarding failure um, and described that what we were doing was actually establishing this sort of pressure cooker situation um, in the family home and around family life. Children's Commissioner um, for England at that point as well highlighted the same um, concerns um, about increased risk of abuse and neglect during the pandemic and really talked about these circumstances at home where um, household stresses were going to be 
um, higher, understandably, with families all being um, confined to the family home um, and not allowed to go out and have the usual releases that they may have uh, normally had. Um, that there was going to be the financial impact for families as well, where um, parents may have um, job insecurity and um, money may have become even more difficult. Um, this was also going to set up a, um, a platform for increased domestic violence, um, uh, substance misuse and mental health issues um, as people started to turn to sort of negative, more negative coping strategies um, for um, being confined at home. Um, and as we've said, the sort of usual safety nets that we would usually have um, to look out for children and um, especially our vulnerable children, um, such as um, visits from children's social care, um, uh, being seen in schools and all of the other support um, services that might have been around to help family um, were not as able to have regular contact with families um, and therefore, again, um, may have, um, have missed um, children who are vulnerable but not picked up um, in the way that we would have before. Um, then just recently, um, Anne Longfield, the Children's Commissioner for England, um, there was a publication um, called Childhood in the Time of Covid, um, which is worth having a look through um, when you have a moment. Um, and again, highlighted that view that children have fewer health risks from um, Covid-19 and yet have um, disproportionately suffered um, from the nation's efforts to control um, and looking back at um, the pre-COVID statistics, even before um, uh, the crisis struck, there were um, about 2.2 million children um, in the UK living in households which were affected by, um, by um, any one of the, the toxic trio, which is um, for um, those who don't... Uh, can, can you speak into the mic? We're losing you. Oh, sorry. I'll I'll try and um, people don't usually say I'm too quiet, but um, that's fine. Um, it's when you, can you turn hear me your now. It's when you turn your ah, head away. Ah, that's fine. That's fine. I'll try and keep. Uh, keep don't there. waggle your head. Um, <laughs> that's all right. Um, so, as I was saying, um, there's, um, there are about 2.2 million children who um, lived in households um, where there were um, any one of um, or um, one of the factors of the toxic trio. So, um, people may have heard of that phrase from um, the media or of, um, from other safeguarding contexts as well. So, um, the toxic trio are these three factors which you will um, often find um, in children where other safeguarding concerns are raised. Um, there may be um, substance misuse, alcohol or drug dependency in the background, um, uh, domestic violence happening in the home um, and other um, mental health illness in the um, in the parents. So, um, and so even before the crisis had struck, there was already a big setup of um, of uh, children being very vulnerable um, in the um, in the family home. Um, and um, so obviously the um, the view was that um, through lockdown and the um, extra stresses that were um, put in place um, as a result of the pandemic, um, that these numbers were likely to swell. Um, and um, these families who were locked down in close quarters for um, for a long period of time um, were likely to um, to suffer as a result of this. Um, looking at um, child poverty um, in uh, in the pandemic as well, um, obviously we've uh, we've mentioned about the financial stresses that um, families may have experienced throughout the lockdown periods, um, and it was felt that um, that uh, be COVID, um, as you can see. Um, there were about 4.3 million children who were um, living in relative poverty, and that number has increased, um, uh, although it's it's the early days at the moment to have a really accurate picture of that. Um, but um, the um, estimate is about 4.5 million um, uh, living in poverty um, post-COVID. Some children have been um, obviously driven into poverty as a result of what's happened um, with COVID, and some children may, um, through the financial um, supports which have been put in place, been lifted out of um, that as well. Um, but I think that um, it's common sense really to appreciate that um, that with the economic crisis that's going on, it's likely to have a big knock-on effect in increasing child poverty in the country, um, which was already um, in a, a bad way before. Um, 
Looking at um, education, just before we get into the sort of specifically safeguarding issues, um, again, before the crisis, um, the estimate was that disadvantaged children were about 18 months behind their wealthier peers. And so it's very likely that that disadvantage gap is going to have widened. Um, obviously, during the first lockdown, um, there were specific groups of children who um, were still recommended to go to school. Um, so children of key workers um, and um, children who may have uh, um, special educational needs. Um, and um, even though the recommendation was there for these children to go to school still, um, the reported uptake was um, pretty low. Around 8% of those children who could have still been going to school were actually going um, with the the understandable concerns, I suppose, from um, from parents um, and the the wish to keep them safe and um, keep them home. Um, but within that, there will have been um, vulnerable children who um, may have really benefited from being at school as well, who then again were missed. Um, and the estimate is that there's uh, 575 million school days missed for our children in the UK um, since March, which is a staggering amount. Um, as we know as well, Ofsted inspections were suspended during the pandemic um, and a lot of the learning for those children who were um, still at home went to remote learning. Um, but that only works if you have the um, access to the technology to be able to um, participate in that. Um, and what was being described in some of the reports that we've spoken about um, was that um, some children who um, were part of families that didn't have a home um, and were being housed in um, bed and breakfasts, for example, there may have been a full family living in a single room um, in a bed and breakfast um, and they wouldn't have had the access to the technology that other people may have had. Um, some families that were disadvantaged were um, trying to um, support the education of their children. Um, through a single um, shared smartphone, for example. Um, and um, so you can see that um, online um, learning and remote learning at home has significant um, challenges for, um, for families who don't have access to that technology. Um, and the um, Chief Inspector for Schools in England has um, just recently said that, um, that COVID-19 has exposed an already crumbling um, infrastructure that fails to meet the needs of um, of uh, our most vulnerable uh, children um, and has failed to do so all too often. So what did we see, I suppose, uh, in um, in the NCH, and I'm sure in a number of hospitals across uh, across the region, um, we saw, saw an, a reduction in the number of children um, coming through the ED. Um, the RCPCH had reported that ED attendances were, um, were down by about 93% in the first lockdown. Um, and um, we had expected to see that um, because uh, families um, and uh, vulnerable children weren't necessarily being picked up in other ways, that we might have seen um, children coming through ED um, with other injuries or um, sort of other incidental pickups of harm. We didn't necessarily see that so much, which um, I, I suppose is, is a worry in itself as well, um, that children who may have been harmed um, were potentially just still at home in that situation. Um, we also saw late presentations of important medical conditions. So um, I remember seeing a few children presenting quite late in DKA because of the worries about um, uh, of uh, their symptoms being attributed to possible COVID. Um, and right at the beginning, um, we cancelled a lot of our non-urgent services, outpatient clinics. So we weren't seeing children that we normally would have been seeing then started to move to remote consultations, um, usually by phone, sometimes by video. And again, you don't really have um, your eyes on the child um, in the same way that you would have before. Um, and then our child protection medical assessments, we'll come on to that shortly, um, and in the changes that we saw there. Um, but um, certainly we streamlined our process for that as well, wanting to minimise the time that parents and families and children were in hospital, um, potentially putting them at risk of picking up COVID. So we were doing a lot of the initial steps um, over the telephone in our usual history taking, and then the children were being brought up um, for the examination part only. Um, so our actual time where we were spending with children directly um, was much reduced compared to what we would normally expect and you lose out on a lot of things that you might observe about the um, interaction with families and um, their general observations on how the children are, um, how they're behaving, what their development seems to be like. So um, there certainly was a lot that we've lost there. Um, uh, there was also the limited um, scope for parents um, to come in and look after um, children. So um, if parents um, if one parent came in um, for a time, they weren't allowed to swap over. So, um, and sometimes that's a, a very useful thing for parents to be able to do in terms of coping with 
um, difficult balance of looking after a child in hospital and then also looking after um, the um, situation that's ongoing at home. So, um, and especially for some of our long stay patients, um, it must have been incredibly stressful for those families um, where they were apart for a long period of time. Um, some of the key things that um, that of positive note um, that have been there are that um, actually there's been a lot of really good virtual um, networking. I suppose today is an example of that. Um, we've all got very used to using virtual platforms, um, and in terms of networking across the region and um, and nationally from a safeguarding perspective, um, it's really been helpful to be able to dial into um, things and share learning quite quickly um, rather than um, having to uh, have everything postponed and then travel to things later on. And also in terms of um, our safeguarding meetings, um, so strategy meetings and case conferences, it's been very helpful that the, um, the professionals have been able to access those meetings and be available for those um, with a bit more ease than, um, than having to traipse up to the hospital. So um, we've been seeing a, a really nice um, boost in um, uh, general practitioners being able to attend um, and also the allied health um, healthcare professionals. Um, so that's been a, a real positive. Um, coming on to our child protection medical assessments, um, uh, we uh, reported some work um, earlier in the year um, just looking at our numbers of children who were being referred for child protection medical assessments, so children are being referred from children's social care um, to us. And often what we would have experienced in the past was that um, uh, that most of those referrals would come from concerns picked up at school, um, then being relayed to children's social care, and then they would come in for a medical assessment where it was appropriate, um, and also pick up by the police as well. Um, so we were worried that um, that the number of children being referred to us was um, was down, um, and so we looked at um, the time period of January to April. Um, and compared it to the same period in previous years. And this was all across um, the um, sort of northern patch of the northeast. So um, Northumberland, um, North Tyneside, Gateshead and Sunderland. And um, what we found was that there was a, um, a significant drop in the number of children being referred for medical assessments. Um, so as you can see, it was pretty steady in 2018 and 2019 with about 150 referrals a month um, and then dropped by a third down to 100. Um, uh, in 2020. Um, and when you look, um, there was a dramatic drop down um, in 2020, specifically in April, um, with just over 10 children being referred across the whole patch for um, child protection medical assessments. Um, so there was a dramatic um, decrease in those numbers, um, which was similar to what the pieces were uh, reporting as well. Um, just to bring in a, um, a couple of cases um, along the way, we'll um, talk about this one just now, um, just in terms of um, child protection medical assessments and um, and thinking about specifically the different types of harm um, that we see. So this is mainly in relation to physical um, physical abuse. Um, what we saw was that um, whilst children may not be being picked up in um, schools, some children were actually um, taking it upon themselves to escape um, harmful situations, which is an awful thought, but that's uh, what children have to do. Um, and um, so this first example was a, um, a case of five siblings um, between um, 10 and 16 years of age. Um, and two siblings had, um, had actually on this day um, fled the family home and flagged down a police car um, because of the harm that was happening to them at home. Um, they had alleged that um, parents were physically harming them um, and chastising them in a number of ways um, with the use of different implements, um, rulers, cables, wires, shoes. Um, and ultimately, three of those children were brought up for child protection medical assessments. And they all gave the same sort of story um, of um, chastisement and abuse. These are some of the quotes that were um, that the children volunteered themselves um, during those medical assessments. So, um, anything that's um, that's hard that my parents can find, they hit me with. Um, they reported that now every that now school was closed, that they had more of a chance to hit me every day, um, saying that dad hits me a lot unless he's sleeping, um, and that the children were scared to go back because if they went back, it might all start again. One of the children had a stutter and um, and he commented that, um, that the father would hit him when he would stutter at home. So um, they also described being very hungry at home. They were having um, very sparse meals just twice a day, um, usually um, in the morning, just a, a small bowl of cereal and then nothing until the evening time. And it sounded a very sparse meal again. 
Um, parents themselves, however, denied hitting the um, children and um, even suggested um, when the history was taken that the children were likely to have just been hurting themselves. Um, when we look back at um, the previous records, actually, there was um, a lot of social care involvement that had been there in the past as well. So um, there have been a number of child protection inquiries for this family um, previously. They'd previously been on a child and need plan, had different um, child and family assessments. And there have been concerns raised in the past about inadequate supervision of the children, um, about the home conditions. Children had actually had a brief period in foster care um, and um, some of the children had been missing for periods of time as well, which had raised alarm. Um, and um, right back at the very beginning, um, there was concern that the children were reporting that these adults who were looking after them weren't actually their parents. Um, so there was a really, um, really significant background there. And then these children um, were having to find their own um, source of support during a, a difficult time. All three children that were seen had a number of injuries, all of a similar pattern um, of sort of linear scarred injuries, um, which fitted really with the history they were giving of um, inflicted injuries with the use of an implement. Um, and um, so the parents were arrested um, initially, um, and then the children have been subsequently cared for um, in foster care again. So, and hopefully this might be the time that, um, that the situation improves for the children now. Um, the quite extraordinary lengths that children have to go to to, um, to be seen and perhaps if they'd been in school um, they would have been picked up sooner. So, so in terms of other forms of physical abuse, um, uh, the, uh, the Great Ormond Street team um, along with Birmingham as well had reported um, higher rates of abusive head trauma in babies. Certainly that was a um, a topic of conversation on a number of our um, national dial-in um, uh, telephone calls um, where we were um, we were asked whether in our region we were seeing the same sorts of things. Um, in Great Ormond Street, they saw a um, substantial rise in the number of um, abusive head trauma um, cases and shaken baby cases that um, that were presenting to their services. We hadn't actually seen that in, um, in the early part of lockdown and other places in the UK weren't reporting that as well. It seemed Great Ormond Street in Birmingham were the key centres where that seemed to be a, a noticeable um, trend. Um, however, certainly since um, over the last few months, we've had um, quite a significant number of um, children with um, head injuries um, and specifically babies with um, quite um, substantial head injuries and, um, and life-changing um, injuries presenting, which is um, unusual and not what we would have expected perhaps at um, the earlier part of um, autumn. Um, what the Ormond Street team reported was that um, whilst over the, um, the same time period in the previous years, they'd only seen sort of one um, case each year of, um, of abusive head trauma. Um, in this um, period during lockdown, they saw 10 cases, which is a, um, a huge uh, jump for them. Um, in terms of sexual abuse, um, obviously children who were spending um, a lot more time at home in a situation where they weren't um, uh, they weren't uh, necessarily being seen by other people, by their friends, by other family members, um, it's increased the um, the chances and the risks to children of um, of sexual abuse and um, and Childline and NSPCC um, certainly reported that there was um, an increase um, number of contacts to them um, about intrafamilial um, child sexual abuse during that time um, and obviously um, if the abuser is within the family you're suddenly at home spending a lot more time with that person um, in the family home without those normal um, outlets and um, other opportunities to disclose abuse um, and certainly um, for um, a number of children who presented to our hospital with um, deliberate self-harm as part of those initial assessments um, we had a couple of disclosures um, from young people about um, uh, more historic um, sexual abuse that was happening so um, we just need to be very mindful of, um, of giving children safe environments to still um, be able to make those disclosures where they need to. Um, and um, obviously alongside that as well, um, the risks from being online um, for significant amounts of time. So um, during uh, lockdown, we've all spent more time online, um, but um, children, young people, I'm sure, um, being no exception to that. Um, and um, not only for education purposes, but for um, access to social media and other forms of entertainment, such as um, online gaming. Um, and so there was an increased risk um, for sure of, um, of online abuse uh, happening. Um, and also, um, uh, there are systems of supervision and, um, and moderation um, within online platforms. Um, there was, um, uh, there was, these services were certainly overstretched um, during that time. Um, 
the Internet Watch Foundation reported that there were um, was a significant jump in the number of reports from the public about sexual abuse online um, in uh, the um, between March and July in 2020 compared to the previous year. So um, an increase of nearly 15,000 reports, um, of about 50%. Um, and um, there's certainly been calls more recently for um, an online harms bill um, in order to um, have a, a duty of care requirement for um, online service providers and, um, and social media companies, um, which is then also followed up um, by being able to enforce compliance and um, have proper oversight and supervision um, of um, how these uh, companies are operating. Um, Domestic abuse. Uh, so, on uh, again, on the, um, the national and um, regional dial-in meetings that we were having, um, the police were um, quite consistently reporting to us that they were having um, an increased number of call-outs to um, to the homes for instances of domestic abuse. Um, and this has also been um, mirrored by what's been reported in the National Domestic Abuse Helpline. Um, and the visits to their website had, um, had increased by 800%. Um, compared to the coronavirus um, figures. And also, um, we know that um, this has provided a, um, a particular time for um, increased exploitation of um, children, young people. So um, suddenly children were um, a bit more accessible, I suppose, in that they weren't in school. Um, and um, if children are at home spending a lot more time online, they were being opened up to um, online um, grooming and exploitation. Um, and um, the, there was this um, opportunity that um, that gangs would start to um, recruit um, other people into their um, their dealings. So um, and there was a move to um, recruit people from their um, from their local areas, um, and this was reported in the um, in the BBC just in the middle of um, summer as well. Um, so um, county lines being one of the main um, themes of this um, during lockdown, it was um, the initial thought was that maybe county lines and um, and drug trafficking, that criminal exploitation, may decrease. But gangs, um, as we know, are very um, sophisticated, and um, as uh, as soon as the money starts to dry up, they will find other ways to adapt and um, ensure that um, that the flow is still there. Um, so whilst um, there were fewer children being reported missing, um, those children who were being uh, reported missing were going for longer periods um, and being transported to um, trap houses for long, uh, longer periods. And these are um, houses which are used as a base for um, supply of drugs and, um, and uh, selling of drugs. Um, as we said, there was a move to um, local recruitment, so um, to in order to um, let children deliver um, uh, drugs locally, um, and use of taxis rather than public transport in order to um, help um, move product around. Um, Runners and uh, dealers were also disguised as key workers and delivery drivers, um, which obviously at the time there was a lot of that happening, wasn't there, um, with um, people regularly um, dropping parcels off. And um, so that was a cover which was also used. Um, and um, as we said, this um, increased vulnerability of children being isolated at home um, and, um, and also then um, the situation of uh, domestic abuse at home increased the likelihood of, um, of grooming as well happening. Um, Coming on to um, neglect, um, this is one of the most commonly experienced forms of um, maltreatment that we see, um, and um, just under 50% of children who were who are on child protection plans will be on them because of neglect. Um, and um, there was certainly an impact um, from COVID on children um, uh, who were living in households where neglect was already a feature. Um, and um, we um, certainly got an, a number of um, new referrals for children um, where teachers were um, dropping things off at home um, and um, dropping um, back lunches um, off at home, using um, concerns about the family living conditions. This comes on to the, um, the next case study, which um, was a set of um, siblings, which we saw um, just in the middle of summer. Um, and I'd actually, when these um, children came through, I realised that I'd actually seen one of the um, siblings previously as well um, uh, for a child protection medical assessment um, the previous year. Um, and at that point, I remember noting that this family had um, quite a significant amount of um, social care input and support already. Um, but the feeling at that time was um, that actually um, the mother was working very well with 
children social care and actually with um, uh, with all of this quite intensive support um, improvements were being made though there was a bit of reassurance there um, these three siblings then um, presented for child protection medical assessments um, following a, um, concerns raised by a routine visit to the family home, um, which was just at the end of lockdown, actually, um, just after it had finished the first time. Um, and um, there were significant concerns raised, which I'll come on to next. Um, and the children were also found with bruises. Um, and so they were brought through for child protection medical assessment. Um, this actually being the third um, child protection medical assessment for one of the, um, the children. Um, and as I've said, um, there was heavy um, social care involvement already, and these children were all on child protection plans for neglect already. The concerns that had arisen on this um, seemingly routine um, visit to the home was that the, the home conditions were extremely poor. And you get a good page from social workers when they bring children for their uh, for child protection medical assessments as to whether the home conditions are um, just not great or whether they're bad or whether they're some of the worst that they've seen and th that was certainly the category for this family. Um, they said that the, the entire house was just in an awful state um, but um, when they got there the tumble dryer was um, on in the sitting room and just expelling the hot air into the room, um, that you couldn't move around the sofa in the living room because of the rubbish, takeaway cartons, um, dirt, nappies were all just lying on the floor. Um, but um, in the bathroom, they found a, a kitchen knife um, within reach of um, of these three young children. Would have been um, along with cigarette buds around. But the children's beds had no covers on them, no pillows, and that there were springs projecting from the mattresses. Um, the bedroom walls were stained with feces, and there were handprints going through the um, stains on the walls as well. Um, and when they went into one of the children's rooms, there was an unidentified male behind um, the children's bedroom door holding a pair of scissors and some um, some nails, um, and which obviously made the social worker very concerned about her own safety, let alone the safety of the children. Um, he felt that the adults in the household were um, quite heavily under the influence of substances and that also there was um, next to no food in the household. Um, and they also found incidentally a, um, a crossbow um, sat in the baby's cot as well. So had a significant number of worries. Um, when the social worker came up and started to talk to me about the um, social setup, it was very different from um, the year or so ago that I remember speaking to one of the social workers about this family said that they had ongoing concerns about substance misuse in this family, that the father um, had significant links to gangs and um, drug dealing, um, and had also had issues with possession of weapons. Um, when I asked the, um, the uh, mum, uh, we were talking about the general toileting of the children, and when I asked her about, um, about the eldest child, she said that he was heavily constipated and um, not really making any improvements with that. I asked why, and she said that, well, he won't go to the toilet when he needs to, um, and certainly not at night since the house was petrol bombed recently. And I had never experienced that sort of thing coming out as uh, in um, speaking with families. Um, it was also noted that the father had been intentionally run over um, by a car on two occasions in connection with um, this sort of gang warfare which was happening. So all of this for a group of three young children under um, under the age of, I think, six um, to be living in um, was was just absolutely appalling. And of course, um, with the harm that was happening to children, you also have to worry about the um, the harm that's happening between the parents as well and, um, and um, the support that's there for them. Um, what I think this um, showed um, really was that um, there were there are a number of families where they may have been making some improvements with a lot of social care input suddenly when those support networks aren't there um, and you don't have the support of friends and family in the way that you would have done before. Um, you don't have those regular visits to the home by social care um, or not in the same way perhaps with a move to um, telephone um, assessments or video um, call assessments. Um, suddenly you don't have the same protections for children um, in, a, in a very difficult situation. Um, what we've seen as well in terms of um, uh, mental health and children's well-being is that um, a lot of children have um, found the isolation of um, lockdown extremely challenging and very difficult, um, suddenly being cut off from seeing your friends, um, being at home um, with your family um, for a long uh, period of time, not having those usual outlets and, and fun things to be able to go and do. Um, and um, surveys have shown that um, children have felt that 
um, that isolation compared to previous times um, and that a lot of children were feeling more um, sad, uh, worried and, um, and stressed. And certainly it felt like we've been seeing um, a lot more in the way of presentations of young people with self-harm to the hospital. And nationally, there's been an increase in, um, in child suicide um, as well across this period of time. Um, the RCPCH have um, quite a nice um, uh, booster which you can have um, for um, your area of work, which talks about general things to look out for with COVID. And it talks about those in terms of a... Um, red, amber and green um, signs of COVID um, and uh, in terms of the clinical features. But at the bottom of that, it has this box as well, which talks about things to look out for in terms of mental health um, for children and young people and gives some um, signposts as well to um, services that might be able to help your um, child or young person during this um, period. And I thought that was a really nice way to integrate um, the fact that COVID does not just have an impact on your physical health that um, young people are. I'm suffering as, as much as adults are with their own mental health during um, difficult times. Um, and then just thinking more widely um, beyond um, the pandemic, uh, um, uh, just thinking more widely beyond the, um, the pandemic as well, um, the, there is um, financial support out there for families. It certainly there has been um, a boost, at least in um, seeing that the government are now tackling um, school meal provision outside of um, of term times, um, and so there, there are some um, benefits to um, to see to this. Um, uh, there's certainly support out there for children who are exposed to domestic abuse and um, looking through the um, services which are available on Childline and um, through the NSPCC. Um, there is a lot out there um, for children and young people. So certainly if you have any um, children in your um, services uh, that, um, that you think might benefit, that's a good place to signpost them to. Um, and um, there's um, support in place in schools as well to help um, uh, respond appropriately to, um, to the fact that young people will have been having a very difficult time recently um, and also to the, for those people who have experienced um, different forms of harm um, and adverse experiences. Um, I think that hopefully in the next few years um, there will be a bit more progress made in terms of online safety. I think that's been something which has um, been talked about for a long time, but hopefully um, with what's coming out of the pandemic and, and people's better understanding about how um, how harm is uh, um, is perpetrated, I suppose, across um, online platforms, um, it, hopefully that will start to um, make an improvement um, in the near future um, with a bit more regulation and supervision. Um, I think that's everything that we were going to talk about. There's a few references there um, for uh, where some of the information that we've um, pulled together has come from. Um, and then perhaps it would be a good time if there, if there is time just to um, open things out for a discussion. I haven't actually had eyes on the chat box um, throughout this, but maybe I can close my slides and then come to that. I have been keeping an eye on the chat box, and there's only one chat from me. Um, oh, that's fine. Though. Yeah, yeah, I can't see anything there. But <laughs> uh, no, because I sent it to the wrong person. Poor fellow. Um, is it? Was there something different, uh, like, for example, preventive, uh, a safe placing of children on uh, preschool children um, who were on borderline of safety? when the second lockdown came has there been any move to uh, to heighten security for those few children because there has been one murder recently and then the, of course there was another that, that's just been um in in the press and uh, very yeah. small babies um especially with all the head injuries that you're reporting i just wondered if something was different this time than the first time, which is understandable. The second think, time uh, is unforgivable. Um, I don't think there was. Yeah, I don't think there was in particular, um, as, as far as I'm aware. And I think social care have been um, under a particularly um, difficult set of circumstances. Your, 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 your microphone is um, not working. Please. Yeah, that's sorry, it. mate. Sometimes it's a bit directional for, um, yeah, for these computers. Well, so, um, I don't think that. 
Yeah, I think um, I don't think there was any particular change um, in in that sense in terms of preventative um, work ahead of a second lockdown. I think one of the things that um, was maybe advantageous was that people were very well used to um, the use of PPE and things. And I think that there, um, there's perhaps been um, a bit more understanding that we need to keep eyes on children um, and going out to the family home and um, doing assessments where they're um, where they're needed. Um, and I think the emphasis of getting children into schools um, and having eyes on has, has been a big change, which is one that absolutely had to happen. Um, I think social care themselves have been under um, very difficult circumstances. You've got a problem with audio again. Uh, sorry, yeah, can you yeah, hear me now? It's yeah, more sorry. Directional, yes. No, I was that's trying really to include Caroline, but um, the, um, I was trying to say that um, social care themselves have had very difficult circumstances because they came into um, the pandemic on the back of years of austerity where um, their services were already under significant pressure. And, um, and I think social, care, social worker recruitment was very challenging for um, a long period of time. And then to go into the pandemic where they weren't allowed necessarily to go out to families' homes um, and undertake the normal assessments they would have. Um, but then also as a result of the lockdown availability, I think, of foster carers has um, dramatically dropped as well. Um, and so um, facing children um, has, uh, I imagine, been a, a particular challenge too. So, um, so yeah, I think it's been very difficult all round. Yeah, um, I would, I would agree. There was nothing specific that was put in place, but I think there was, there was much. Like Andrew said, that social workers was much more adept at working in this situation. Um, there's been a big move to get children's child protection figures down in Newcastle, and actually, children on child protection plans has gone down in the last couple of months. Uh, the children um, in care numbers have gone up. Again, there was a delay in getting children off the other end out of care because of the courts. Situation. So there's been a huge pressure from children's social care, and um, as Andrew was saying, in terms of sort of budgets and austerity, um, to look at taking children off child protection plans and uh, safely. So and a lot of work's going on um, with sort of working with families to try and, and, and do a much more preventative work with families and identify those those families who need support. So I think that social services, I think, have done, you know, a, a, an amazing job, really, to, to keep the show, you know, on, on, on track, really. Um, yeah. I, I think I've got a few more questions. I think Marika's question has probably been answered. Um, Frederick is asking whether, whether the referral patterns improved between lockdowns and how long do you think it's going to get back to pre-COVID working patterns or did it go back to that? I, th I think we're pretty much, um, from our perspective in hospital, I think we're pretty much back at, um, at the same referral levels that we were having um, pre-COVID. Um, I think we've had some very um, busy few months. Um, and I, I think also um, from, we've had a lot of um, input from the specialty teams as well within the hospital um, who've had concerns about um, their young people who are maybe not being brought for um, the treatments that they need as part of their long-term conditions because of worries about COVID. And, um, and um, a lot of those cases have actually been taken on board um, really quite robustly from children's social care. Their response has been pretty amazing. Um, so I, I do get the feel the feeling that um, sometimes in the past we may have had to um, spend a bit of time trying to convince social care perhaps, maybe that's not the right word, but um, of the concerns that we've had. But recently it just feels that there's maybe been a bit of a change um, and, um, and they're, they're very much on board with um, the concerns that we're raising. And I, I assume that part of that as well is that we're a key service that have our eyes on kids um, quite regularly um, at the minute. Sorry, I just wanted to mention about sexual abuse because we were really very worried we weren't seeing children being brought um, with concerns around sexual abuse, especially we thought about the intrafamilial, you know, we thought these kids are being sexually abused uh, within the family. Nobody knows what's happening. We're going to expect to see a big surge when children go back to school. So we didn't see hardly any referrals for sexual abuse assessments from in, in sort of the end of March, April, May, June. By July, our figures were back to what they were usually. What we haven't seen is that surge of children coming through for historical sexual abuse assessments. So I think they will still be coming through. We've had uh, uh, some come through with quite sort of worrying emotional, psychological kind of issues, um, uh, as well as this history of, of, of uh, 
allegations of sexual abuse. So we've seen some quite complex, challenging presentations with young people, very uh, sort of from a sort of uh, mental health um, presentation. Um, so I, I, I do worry that there will that will have been going on, uh, and we haven't seen these kids yet. Um, so that surge of, of referrals that we were expecting to see in, in September hasn't happened as yet. So I think that is a concern. Andrew and uh, Caroline, there's just one final question. Can I just say that there's been a, a glowing thanks from an awful lot of people on a very brilliant and incredibly informative and very frightening talk generally. It's um, uh, like all these horror movies we've been watching from Netflix. Anyway, is there any discussion about creating a national plan on how to respond change services, provide support for children, families in future national emergencies. This, this, they came bottom of the pile. And as far as PPE was concerned, there was not even a, cons a consideration of that for essential so social workers. They were not considered in any way essential. That's me adding it on to Jeremy too. Right? So is there a national... Yeah, well, I, I think... I think that's absolutely right. Um, and um, I think a lot of us have had um, strong concerns that children were just at the bottom of the pile um, from from the outset of um, of COVID. Um, and certainly it, um, it beggared belief um, so right towards the beginning that um, that pubs were still open and um, and yeah, children weren't necessarily um, able to go back to school yet. So um, I think the, the government had to get their priorities right. Um, and it feels like um, certainly in the second lockdown, a lot of um, lessons ha have been learned. Um, I assume um, that um, a lot of this is going to be taken forward um, in terms of Planning for future similar events, um, and certainly there's a um, a lot of calls from um, particularly people like the Children's Commissioner um, for England um, to make sure that children are put at the centre of um, any future plans. Um, and um, the RCPCH has been collecting data throughout this um, time period as well, in particular from a safeguarding perspective. Um, so um, uh, you would hope that that will all inform um, future decisions, but I think um, uh, we're all um, very biased, but appropriately so, that children should be prioritised throughout all of this. And I think one of the key steps is making sure that children, um, that schools are still um, kept open no matter what. Um, Jeremy, I'm going to uh, 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 close on very shortly. Uh, hang on, there is another question. Oh. It's just a it's just a comment. Children don't vote or pay tax. That's why they're not a priority for this government. It's just a comment which I everybody would agree with. Jeremy, do you want to yeah, unmute Jeff, if you want to say anything yeah. about that? About the response? And if you have some thoughts, and if you're still here. Um well, thanks, Andrew, for your your really useful um, presentation and, and, and summarising it. I just think that, you know, it's not just pandemics, is it? It's the national emergencies and a, a real question about how our RCPCH or other organisations can take forward some sort of learning. One of the things I think that there's been a lot of research done, there's been a lot of information about the impact of um, the pandemic and lockdown. There's been a lot less about what we might do next time and you know, probably there will be a next time, whether it's soon or in the in the uh, you know a long way in the future. Um, that seems to be what people are saying to us. So I do think there needs to be an eye on the future and and a future plan, accepting the fact that it wouldn't be very easy to put in place, and of course it would be very expensive. Yeah. Thank you, Jeremy. I, I think we'll be learning about this for a long time to come. Right. I think we probably need to call to a halt now. Can we? Yes, we do. It's uh, thirteen twenty. I'm delighted uh, that you turned up and you, uh, oh, it's been an excellent morning and it's been an excellent closing uh, experience. So bless you all. Thank you very much. And please come back for more in March or even earlier. There are other events coming up. Next year and we'll be sending out the usual literature. So look out guys for this specialty days that we talked about at the beginning um, and the two GP three days and of course the conference will be running next year in some shape or form without a doubt <laughs> thank you everyone thank you and goodbye thank you good night goodbye good afternoon <laughs>